Okay, so this piece that we're seeing right now is uh, the Hagia Sophia, the exterior of this building, and it is in modern day Istanbul. It was originally named Constantinople, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and the patrons to build the Hagia Sophia were Justinian and Theodora. Uh, there was a riot here in Constantinople just preceding the building of the Hagia Sophia and on the ruins of the riot they decide to build one of the most iconic and most beautiful uh, churches that typify Byzantium uh, architecture in the world and then um, later when it was turned into a mosque which I'll talk about later it was also used as a uh, model for a lot of the mosques that we're going to be studying when we hit um, move on to the Islamic culture. So uh, Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom. It is also Christ as the embodiment of divine wisdom. And um, as you can see with this plan right here, it's sort of a cross between a central plan, which would be here, but also a longitudinal plan um, or the basilica plan. So it's really a combination of the two. It was built, um, I believe I said, in 532 to 537, so that's only five years, uh, which is very fast for a building of this size and caliber, and it was dedicated in 537. The architects were um, Arthemius of Trollis and Isidorus Miletus. These were both um, mathematicians, not architects, and uh, so we see a lot of innovations with the half domes and with the domes, and that was due to the brilliance of the um, those who are considered architects, even though their main um, uh, their main job was to be mathematicians. The building covers over an one and a half acres and the dome is 108 feet in diameter. It served as the palace chapel for the Byzantine emperors and was the site of their coronations. Later it's going to, um, after the Ottoman Turks capture Constantinople in 1453, it was converted into a, an Islamic mosque and immediately adapted to fit um, Islamic culture rather than Christian culture. Um, let's see, what else can I say about this one right now? Uh, the, the architects studied the Pantheon to see how the round dome would sit on the flat walls and that's where we see the invention of the pendentives which we're seeing right here. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about the pendentives in when I go to the interior, but you can see them on the plan as this triangular feature right here that um, supports the dome, which is in the center. Um, some of the other outside features that we can see are these minarets. Minarets is an Islamic feature to mosques that are um, a tool used to call the faithful to prayer. And these are actually called, these ones are um, pencil minarets, and they're pretty typical to the Ottoman architecture. And while all Islamic mosques have minarets, not all of them are thin like these ones are, or the pencil size, I guess. And um, the, the ones in other parts of the Middle East are um, larger, wider. Some of them oftentimes have more than four. Uh, so it really just depends on um, on the mosque, but this one is going to set the standard. Um, moving on into the interior of the church, um, we really see an interplay between two main elements in that space and light. Unlike Roman architects who preferred to support the dome on a drum, uh, this one is, they're trying to support it with those pendentives. Um, almost like to hide the um, how this is supported and then to draw the eye up even further to the dome. This dome is supported on four piers and they're largely hidden from the eye. Um, here are the, the piers right here you can see 
you can see what those pendentives are and how it holds up the dome and um, and that allows for um, the uh, including of 40 windows these windows are also going to be um, they're close together and the uh, sides that are um, you know covered here are covered in mosaics that are gold and it's almost as if when you're looking up like the dome is floating above this heavenly light um, here's another good example of light coming through the dome and also through these other areas here and uh, that was an intentional choice by the architects so it's almost as if the dome is floating because of the um, not only the pendentives but the dome is also partially supported by a series of half domes and semi domes there's also external buttressing that's added in the 8th century the piers reduce the load bearing function of the walls which allows for that large amount of window space um, this was the first time pendentives were used on such a large scale and it becomes a feature of Byzantine architecture. The interior, which it, it basically appears as if it's not physically possible to exist and that adds to the religious power of the structure for people thought God helps support this building. Um, that's something that is the fact that this building has survived since the um, 500s is um, important because Constantinople or modern-day Istanbul this lies directly on top of um, an earthquake zone and uh, several large earthquakes have uh, hit Constantinople then Istanbul and um, has reduced the buildings around it to rubble but this building remained largely intact with just um, you know there was definitely damage but not enough damage to um, to need to rebuild the building so the light is filled with the interior because of the windows also Justinian had the interior embellished with 40,000 pounds of silver all of which came from um, his own um, his, he donated it himself and that was used in decoration of the altar a canopy sheltering the altar the pulpit and the screen separating the sanctuary the dome was originally covered in gold mosaic and windows were originally filled with tinted glass. The glass was red, green, brown, yellow, and purple. Unfortunately, most of this did not survive after it was converted to a mosque. Um, another interesting feature about um, this building is the innovation of the capital of, on the inside. So you can see here that it's uh, a derivative of the Ionic capital but they're definitely moving away from any type of classical order so that although we have volutes here it certainly doesn't um, look like a typical Roman Ionic capital um, so it avoids the classical illusions it's the surface is deeply carved out of um, and it's supposed to look like acanthus leaves and like I said, there are shrunken scrolls that appear at the bottom corners of the capital. This decoration adds to the visual lightness of the space, and the capital appears as though if it's not even really supporting any weight because of how thin, and um, even though it is holding a tremendous amount of weight, it still doesn't look like it. The deep carving and it is also seen on the capitals and entablatures throughout the structure. Uh, in regards to the ritual that took place when this was a Christian church, the emperor was the only lay person or non-clergy allowed to enter the sanctuary. Other men and women stood in the aisles of the or the galleries where they witnessed the procession of the clergy moving in a circular path from the sanctuary into the nave and then back five or six times. And this made the Hagia Sophia a gigantic theater for the public imperial worship of God, whose presence was assumed to be in the building. Uh, and so definitely this building is significant because it intertwines church and state. Um, now, uh, when it was turned into a mosque in um, after the Ottoman Turks took over the building, 
the um, they added besides the minarets they're also going to add gigantic uh, discs eight huge discs with uh, uh, sayings from the Quran and sayings from Muslim prophets and uh, this was written in Arabic and which is interesting because it's not it wouldn't have been readable at the time that it was added because the people spoke Turkish they also covered up all of the figural imagery and you can see that here um, with what remains of the this mosaic um, now the Islamic faith does not disbelieve in Jesus he's they see him as a prophet not as um, you know God's son so um, they were fine with images of him in regards to him as a person but not him as as seen as the son of God or of God as himself and so they covered up a lot of the mosaics with plaster and paint and then when this was restored in after the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War one um, they're going to take off a lot of the plaster and paint and reveal the mosaics from underneath. Um, they covered the mosaics because of the figural imagery. Because in the Islamic faith, the focus is on the word of God and Allah and didn't want any of the figural imagery to uh, move away from it. So this building is really important for a lot of reasons. Uh, it is um, such a beautiful building that is going to be copied by future architects. Uh, we'll look at one um, in particular when we study uh, the Islamic mosques um, in the Ottoman region. But it is really important because this sets the standard of what, um, what classical Byzantine architecture was and it also sets the standard for really when they start building mosques in um, the 1400s and 1500s of what to copy. So um, here's an interior view where you can see how the, um, the domes and the semi-domes, like the half domes, are going to support the weight of the pendentives and how it spreads out through here throughout this whole area. So we can um, see the apse and then the nave, the south gallery, uh, another thing to add, going back to the Islamic features, is that when they adapted this building to become a mosque, they also had to add um, two very specific features that are in mosques, and that's, well, one was the minaret, which we already talked about, but the other is the mirab, and that's spelled M-I-H-R-A-B, and the mirab is how, um, is the direction of where Mecca is and the, it's off-center to the building because the building is placed on an east-west axis and uh, the mirab is supposed to be pointing to Mecca and so that would have been south from where this um, building stood so um, the mirab is actually kind of at an odd in an odd place not what you would see in a typical mosque where that's the focal point um, but they had to do that because that was the direction of Mecca. They also included um, a minbar, which is where um, one of the um, leaders of the, uh, you know, one of the leaders of the faith for Islam will stand and give speeches. Um, there was also a, uh, like a, let's see, what else, like a, also there was a uh, platform where the Sultan stood and that platform was added to um, this building as well because as I said before it was going to be um, made into a mosque. Uh, it ended, it became a, a museum in 1934 and now it is a museum where they still have the Byzantine features but they've also kept those discs those eight huge round discs that have the, uh, the, the writings that are in calligraphy, which is the most important imagery that comes out of um, the Islamic art. And we'll be talking about that when we get to our next um, section of this unit, which is the Islamic faith. So here's the Hajjia Sophia.
and thanks for listening.